day 473 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Jazzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia is sitting on more than 215,000 military personnel losses there. Then in terms of the Russian hardware losses, we're looking at a whopping 17 tanks, 24 APVs, and 19 artillery. Which, as you can see, double-digit losses for, for tanks for the Russian army is painfully indicative of the Russian army having to deal with the Ukrainian counteroffensive right now. Then we'll head across to the map in Ukraine today, as certain counteroffensive and defensive actions are taking place in Ukraine, as stated by Ukrainian President Zelensky himself recently. And in the last 72 hours, significant operations by the Ukrainian armed forces have been taking place in several sectors of uh, mostly eastern and southern Ukraine. Take, for example, Zaporizhia, the oblast, where the AFU has made some good progress and penetrated Russia's first lines of defense in some areas, including Lobkova, Robotyne, Levadna, Neskuchne, and Blahodatne. Although, map updates with regards to counteroffensives are always slow to update, and compound that with some OPSEC silent treatment, but we still do get some level of accuracy of the battle space picture based on what's consistent or a, a, a commonality received from reports divulged by both sides of the conflict. For instance, there's several pieces of footage now showing Russian units pulling back uh, or flat out fleeing on foot from their own defensive line positions uh, that have just simply crumbled away due to some of these AFU counteroffensive actions. And add to that, in fact, the increasing reports of Russian casualties as they withdraw through their own minefields in something of an unprepared or unplanned mad dash to get the hell out of there. And specifically, almost the entire forward defensive line of the Russian forces near Velika Novosilka, around 20 kilometers long, has been wiped out. And based on Russian drone footage, we also know that the Ukrainian forces are already operating further south of that location, hammering Russian forces. And also, we have an official confirmation now that the AFU captured Blaho.net. So if we zoom right in, we can see the, the blue standing for recently liberated territory. And it actually happened almost without a fight, uh, to quote the, the pro-Kremlin Russian sources, uh, the one named Rybar, actually. And in fact, we also have signs from Russian telegram posts that were screeching over lost positions on the road to Tokmak right there from Vasilivka, which would appear to be caused by Ukrainian forces using artillery from beyond the contact point up there to fire on Russian escape routes. And to even follow up from that, there's actually uh, been a number of explosions surrounding Russian-occupied Tokmak as well. So not a lot of safe places to be right now on the Russian-occupied side, it would seem. Now, as a result of all of these counteroffensive actions, Russian bots are out in full force, attempting to put a positive spin on things for Russia. And remember, one of the primary goals of the, the Russian bots or trolls is to sow those seeds of doubt regarding Ukraine's military capabilities, and thus to ultimately attempt to change public opinion the world over to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table to accept existing land losses followed by a ceasefire. Followed then by Russia just coming back and breaking the ceasefire in about, say, 12 months' time after they get a chance to rebuild some strength. And this is not just some made-up guess of mine. It's simply what Russia does. Uh, for instance, they broke the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, where Ukraine gave up its nukes for security guarantees from Russia. 
Then again, Russia broke the Friendship Treaty of 1997, then the 2003 Sea of Azov agreements, then of course the Minsk Accords, both one and two. All just full of Russian broken promises as they continue to showcase this mafia-style aggression into the neighbouring nation of Ukraine. But I digress, and back to the Russian bots who are looking to put a positive spin on things for Russia, like I said there, as they argue that Ukraine is taking massive losses in this counteroffensive that's failing for Ukraine, which I'm actually reminded of how they said just the exact same thing during, for instance, the Ukrainian Kherson counteroffensive successes back in November, for instance, that one was. And with that in mind, so three days ago, Russia took out a number of infantry fighting vehicles and one Leopard 2 tank and a mine clearer as well from a Ukrainian assault operation somewhere in the Zaporizhia frontline area. Now, immediately, pro-Kremlin sources proclaimed, uh, and in fact, continue to double down on this example, this image, in fact, as being proof of Ukraine's failed counter-offensives. But that's actually where things, to me, get interesting, because, to put it in context, firstly, the Ukrainian forces disembarked the Leopard that was disabled, not destroyed, trucks removed, but uh, since recovered later, and is either in repair right now, or potentially already repaired, as per the last updates. Then, second of all, this is just one tank. Uh, <laughs> and a bunch of infantry fighting vehicles, the, the Bradleys, although Russian misinformationists are really just focusing on the, the tank naturally. But nevertheless, a, a tank and a bunch of the infantry fighting vehicles, of which Ukraine takes out this amount of Russian equipment for breakfast. I'm not even kidding. And then there's lunch, dinner, dessert, and even a midnight snack on just about any given day now. So it's what they call lopsided or asymmetrical warfare, which is not in favor of the Russian forces right now. So if Ukraine takes a, a Leo loss for, say, three, five, or even ten Russian tanks, that would simply be worth it. More importantly, a Ukrainian tanky's likelihood of surviving is so much higher in a NATO tank, like a Leo tank, than a, a Soviet one. Of which, of course, you may remember the Soviet turret tossing competitions as a consequence from a blast by a NATO Javelin ATGM. But even more than all of that, this was just one unit of about 12 units in the, the South Zaporizhia location performing assault operations, and we've got really no information on them. At least, let's say, Russia cannot show us any information for the other 11 or so that may have either fared better or worse, but what we do know, of course, is some liberated zones, particularly the one I've shown you a moment ago. So again, out of context and overplayed by the uh, the Rust bots, as they call them. And then, as for more situations on the ground in this region, uh, Ukrainian strikes occurred on a Russian column of uh, it's about 5 or 10 miles deep into the Russian-occupied territory, probably a bit further closer there, nearby Enahoda, just south of it. And as such, Ukraine ended up cleaning up quite uh, a bit of what you see here. Then we'll scoot across to the Donbass momentarily, as Ukrainian activity was reported in the Luhansk Oblast near Bilirivka. Now, we don't hear much about that one these days, usually quite a, a standstill location of sorts. And although we still don't know a great deal of information about that one yet, there does still be, or seem to be, a, a keen chance that Ukraine is not only limiting its counteroffensive operations just to the central east and the, the, the southeastern zones uh, within Ukraine. But we'll have to wait and see. Then we'll move across down to Bakhmut, uh, no stranger to some information updates this location. Where today, in just the last 24 hours, Ukraine has gained around 1,400 meters in different sections today around the town, as they are now starting to gain ground every day in this location. As it appears that the AFU are looking to orchestrate a, a full surrounding of the town at this point. 
And I really do feel that the Russian army, or really the Russian MOD and Putin himself, made some poor choices to make Bakhmut some sort of a mythical place and promoting it so much in their propaganda previously. Because now Russia is politically tied to this location. Which means they are forced to keep it occupied no matter what. And otherwise, in the event they actually lose it, so Russia loses the town that they've just taken, the Russian MOD and again Putin himself will have some extremely tough questions to answer for on the home front. Of course, after politically parading the town's capture as a huge success for the Russian army in the previous weeks. And a town, no less, that was wastefully used by the Russian forces with a huge loss of life on the Russian side, massive over-expenditures of ammunition and hardware losses that Russia will just never get back. And I actually suspect it would be even more embarrassing for Russia to lose Bakhmut than when it lost large swaths of land in Kherson and the Kharkiv regions previously. And so the means will just be devastating if or when this happens, causing more and more Russians over time to wake up to this pointless invasion that does not and never did serve any advantage for regular Russians in society. And as for some of the Ukrainian forces' advances in the last day or so, again, although we can't really see it yet on the map, uh, Yahidne right there, so really just directly north of Bakhmut almost, is said to have quite the level of Ukrainian advancements there. But then also, just south of the town, the Ukrainian forces conducted several more small-scale counterattacks in the area towards Kleshchivka. So I'm really interested to see how the map really looks, which we should get some updates for soon. Then we'll move down just briefly there to one of the other popular front lines in the Donbass. So Ukrainian units conducted an assault on Russian trenches with Humvees in Avdivka. And this all actually reminds me of one former US general who recently stated that Humvees, although not tanks or F-16s for instance, are not to be underestimated. Due to their high mobility capabilities for performing these quick paced storming assaults. Then just lastly and quickly in the Donbass, a HIMARS strike hit a Russian BM-21 Grad MLRS, so these are the multiple launch rocket uh, systems near Vuladar. And Vuladar may go down in this conflict's history as being one of the most, if not the most attritional, by way of Russian hardware losses, right at this tiny little segment of a scrap heap graveyard. Then we'll swing across on the map to Kherson today. So another day, another war crime for, for Russia, where we have a combination of the press and even Red Cross in this video being subjected to Russian shelling. Which is quite curious considering both sides actually agree and state there is an ecological and humanitarian crisis here following the dam explosion from the other day. But looking at it differently simply means it's just another situation for the Russian army to try to take advantage of. Quite heinously so too. And speaking of, or as for some dam destruction updates, Russia's currently claiming that uh, the Ukrainians destroyed the dam with artillery. However, there is no such artillery that could cause a seismic signal. Not to mention the dam was heavily fortified and designed to withstand artillery strikes from the outside anyway. But let's get a little lighter for a moment in Kherson uh, as animals continue to get rescued. Like this little fella that was swimming directly to the human on the boat. Ah. Then we'll move down a little bit south from here as there was incredible destruction at the Russian HQ in Shashlivtsev. So we have to zoom in right here. Which is and this event is said to be potentially New Year's Eve Makivka levels of army personnel losses for the Russian forces. 
which was said to have about five to 700 uh, Russian soldiers just on top of a, an ammunition dump in a building, which Russian authorities actually claimed really never happened at all. Uh, but uh, except this time it was with the, the Storm Shadow instead of HIMARS, which has all in turn caused Romanian forces to withdraw deep into the Crimean Peninsula. Those are the Russian forces. And we'll zoom out for a moment because the location where that occurred is at least 130, 140 kilometers from the the closest front line so yeah well behind uh well beyond the ability of a of a high mars gimlars strike indeed needed to be something like the storm shadow then we'll move across to some news for today so recently the u.s announced a new 2.1 billion u.s dollar military aid package for ukraine and within the package, it includes Patriot air defense missiles, Hawk air defense systems, missiles for those Hawk SAM systems as well, laser guided rocket munitions, uh, Puma unmanned aerial systems, uh, artillery shells of various sizes. And certainly this package is heavy on air defense systems, which will always be an important piece of protecting Ukrainians that should never stop flowing through, at least for the foreseeable future. Then in some other news, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau arrived in Kyiv yesterday on an unannounced trip to meet with Zelensky, where he paid respects to the fallen Ukrainian soldiers, and he also supported Ukraine's ascension to NATO and hoping for it to occur as soon as possible, and announced a Canadian aid package to Ukraine as well. Then he was also seen walking down the streets of Kyiv, so very good to see. Then I'll have to leave it at that for today, guys, but not before I uh, do a quick round of funnies. So with the first funny, uh, the Russian Frankenstein monstrosities of desperation just continue so ghastly. So here we have a couple of Russian MTLB. These are the amphibious armored fighting uh, vehicles that have received a couple of old Russian Navy 140 millimeter guns or MRL, so the, the rocket launchers, complete with sophisticated cope protection uh, up on top, which previously was the, the deck plate of a Navy ship. And it's all... Also something that will not hold up to even a, a mild angle of an attack vector from your standard Ukrainian kamikaze drone. But wait, there's more. They actually appear to be bolted onto some wood, or in fact wooden pallets, that are then in turn clamped to the hull, making for a, a wood sandwich nudge between stressed metals. I just think Russians need to start asking themselves, how did it come to this? Then in a final funny to round it all off with guys, so in Switzerland, you can pop in your vote for the option to have your say in boycotting uh, Russian hydrocarbons, right? And then you are rewarded to a scene of Putin having problems swallowing that one down. I, I just love the creativity on that one, I do, I really do. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, please leave a comment. I love to uh, be in there and uh, reply where I can. Please like as well. It really helps out boost the channel. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.